My voice is lower than usual. I've got the radio voice. Yeah. <laughs> we make like a few million on commercials. Yeah. Today we have Josh Gibson here. Sorry about that for people who are listening to this. That's really, my, my kids hated it when I would do that. <laughs> they really did. They were like, please do not do the radio voice. I have Josh Gibson here. <laughs> That's my normal voice. So Josh, I've known you since you were five, I think. I think so. Yeah, I was yeah. talking to your parents the other day. I was like, yeah, I think it's about five. And so it's an interesting podcast in the sense that most people that I interview, I really don't know the backstory. But for you, I I know I know most of the backstory. Yeah, and I've watched it grow over time. So um, you're my youngest artist. You're what twenty nine now? I'm twenty eight still. So Ooh, even younger. In February. 20, yeah, so you're twenty eight, and we've represented you since nineteen uh, two thousand and nineteen. Two thousand seventeen. Two thousand seventeen. What is this? Oh yeah, it was yeah. 2017. Sorry, I lost it. Pandemic year's gone. Yeah. Just like boop. I'm trying to, you know, I don't know if you've noticed that, but I look at things like, oh, pandemic versus not pandemic years. I mean, they feel different. It's like time has been moving at a different rate or something. It does actually. Yeah. Yeah. It does actually. When you're really busy, time goes fast and when you're slow and isolated, it goes slow. But I mean, you get more paintings done because time is moving so slow. Yeah. So. Has have you done more paintings because of the pandemic? Definitely. Is that because of the pandemic, or is that because you're now and everybody wants your damn paintings, and you <laughs> go, "I got to get these paintings because everybody a, wants me." A bit of both, yeah, and then think. also I think like more of my time has shifted to that. You know, whereas before I might be doing more other things like animation and stuff, and I still do that, but it's like it's become like a smaller amount of the time. Right. So when you, as a kid, the first time we recognized your artwork, Kathleen actually saw it in your mom's office. Hmm. Your, his mom's a dentist. And um, I think you were maybe eight at that time. And Kathleen actually came home and said, oh, my God, have you seen Josh Gibson's work? And I go, no, I have not seen Josh Gibson's work. She goes, it's like really, really good. And I go, he says, really? And she goes, oh, yeah, it's really, really good. I go, okay, well, we'll put him on the, we'll put him on the watch list. <laughs> Do you remember when you started drawing? I do. Um, I remember, like, I have a weird memory of being, like, two or three years old in, like, preschool, and somebody asked me, like, a teacher or somebody asked me to do, like, a sign, and I had a lot of trouble, like, writing the letters, but then I had a really easy time drawing on it, um, and that's the first memory that I have of and, it. And so you, that was super young. Yeah. And then what about, like, you know, in kindergarten, first grade, all those kind of things. I remember uh, it kind of kicked off maybe in first grade. We had like a fair type of thing where each kid would kind of present something that they had made, like a collection of things. Right. And then other kids would go around and like buy them with like some tickets right. or something. And I remember like people kept buying my drawings. Huh. And so it was like <laughs> a early kind of vote of confidence. I wonder if we have any of those Probably not. That yeah, I don't know. Charles might have bought some. They're like weird little monster drawings yeah. or something. Yeah. Well, you did weird little monster drawings for a long time and still yeah. kind of do, right? Yeah. Um, kind of like surreal stuff. Yeah. It's anime kind of. It's. I don't even know how to describe it. Maybe I, you could describe I don't these know. things that you've been doing since you were like in first grade. Yeah. I'm not, not really anime because I feel like anime has that, uh, the really like, canonical kind of style to it but um it what it reminds me most of is like mobius like that french comic artist like right. the really like a heavy line influence and like dots and like dashes and like mark making type mm -hmm. of stuff and do you have any of those you've got some images we could put up on youtube oh yeah 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 so for those who are watching this on youtube we'll put up some of those into the thing so you can see what we're talking I'll, about i'll give you the most complex ones so oh, people yeah. can just like pour over them yeah, they're super intricate. Yeah. I, I, I remember seeing them for the first time probably six or seven years ago and going, oh, my God, these are incredibly complicated. Yeah. And what is that about doing such complicated, detailed-oriented work that you like? Because it's not what you're doing now. It's yeah. It's completely. It is different. Um, I think that it's it's almost like you can see, like, you know, when you look around, you can see like a texture to everything and everything has a different feel to it. 
and you almost see like a shimmer in the air and stuff. It's trying to translate like all the little textures of things to a drawing, you know, like taking all the real things and turning them into symbols. Mm. Um, and like, you know, capturing, like if this is a very slick surface, like capturing that kind of feel versus like a textured surface. And, mm. So giving it a three dimensionality almost. Yeah. And like kind of moving with the contour, you know, and the way that they're designed, I mean, they're just, first of all, they're extremely compact with lots of, lots of things in them. Tons. Yeah. Do you have a sense of what it's going to be when you start drawing? Um, some of them I do. Um, some of them are like more automatic where it just kind of like it spreads out from a point and kind of makes itself. But if I'm doing it as like a commission or something, then it's generally kind of plotted out with the whole composition and like this goes over here and this relates to that. Yeah, and you're still doing those some of them? Yeah. Um and I have like sketchbooks and sketchbooks full that of I've them. Seen. Yeah. Yeah. And I have that book that's probably out there someplace that's just like full of those drawings. Mm. Yeah, the one that you printed. Yeah. Is that still available? Is that Um yeah, there are like a few copies left. Yeah. I did a really limited printing of it, but And how does people get that if they want to get it? Uh they can just do it through my website, okay. uh joshgib.com. Okay. Good to know. All right, yeah. we'll get that in early in case people tune out. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I just want to get the book. So you're growing up, you have this innate sense of drawing. I know you didn't have an innate sense of soccer because I watched. <laughs> I you were the funniest kid to watch playing soccer. I didn't know that I was the thing on the field. I thought I blended uh, in. No, it was this was what was funny about it is I have this vivid memory of you playing soccer and some kid just taking the ball and kicking it right into you at close range, and you just kind of made a mad face and just kept going. And I thought, ooh, that kid's <laughs> got something going on there. Man. That's he, funny. I don't remember yeah, that at all. Yeah, you, I mean, you took a solid hit. Really? And just kept, yeah, I'm going. And I was like, hmm, this kid, he may seem like he's quiet, but he just took a huge hit that would throw most kids on the ground crying and asking for mom and dad. It even I even winced when I saw it. And I thought, Really? Oh, yeah, and I remember it vividly. <laughs> it's strange yeah um i did i took a number of hits like that when i was a kid <laughs> um but you know all's well that ends yeah, well yeah well that's who, that's your personality yeah perseverance clearly is part of it yeah and so your mom and dad your mo mom's a dentist and your father does you know business deals uh-huh they're what do they think about what you're doing because that you know art is not their thing clearly um i think i mean they've always been like the most supportive people um, I think that they like it, you know, that's, and we're always like, whenever I bring art like here, there's always like almost a pre-show for my parents. And so we'll <laughs> all like work on them, you know, like do a little bit of varnishing and like all that sort of thing together yeah. and just like talk about the paintings. Yeah. So, I mean, they're not like art world people, but like they get it enough, you know, yeah. and they both like have taken art history courses oh, and well, all that's that. Big, so, yeah, that's yeah. big time though. Oh yeah. So they definitely get it. So they, yeah, yeah cause they were you didn't ever get this, oh, Josh, you should go into business kind of thing from your father? Not really. I mean, I think, like, as kids are, I was, like, diametrically, like, opposed to it for a long time. Because, right. like, <laughs> I don't want to do what he does. Like, that's his realm, and I want to have my own place, you know? Um, but, I like, I definitely, I've grown to, like, respect it over time. Um, and... I don't know. I never, they thought I was going to be like a lawyer or like a scientist or something. And like clearly over time, it just like those things like faded away. Um, you know, I just want to do my own thing. Yeah. Well, you clearly are. They're very proud, by the way. I'll, I just talked to your dad the other day and he's like, I'm so proud of my son. And I was like, oh, that's good. That's good. So he gets it, right? He should tell me that. Yeah. I just, yeah. <laughs> well, no, he can't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's that deep stuff you got to yeah. deal with. <laughs> And 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 you're an uh, only child, right? So mm -hmm. that makes a difference as well. Yeah, I think. Um, you know, it'd be interesting. I haven't really looked into it, but kids that don't have other kids when they're growing up, you know, they have to focus. I think somewhat in internally. Mm -hmm. it seems like it. I don't know if you agree with that or. I'd believe it. I mean, there's less. Like, if you just think about it simply, there's less to entertain you. Yeah. So you have to create more of your own entertainment. Um, and like both of my parents have like siblings and that was like part of the reason that they only had one kid. Mm -hmm. Um, cause my mom's sister has always been sick. 
mm. her entire life. And my dad's brother is like kind of a difficult person. Um, and so they both kind of had a reason. So they were like, why not just make one and try to do our best? You know? Right. <laughs> they, and they did. And so you're, you're drawing, you're doing all this um, very detailed, um, I don't want to call it, a, what do you call it? What, what, do you have a name for what, you, what um, these were? I don't, I don't think they're that there's... They're not cartoons, they're not no, anime, I guess, but they're it's, uh, it's fantastical some, almost. Yeah, it's almost like magical realism. Yeah, that's right. Um, and it's like a kind of graphic realism or something, because it's not real, but it's also not a cartoon. Right. You know, so everything's a representation, but it's, um, I, I don't know. I think surrealism, graphic realism, magical realism, mm -hmm. someplace in there. And so at what point did you go, okay, this is where I'm going to go? And when you were in like junior high, high school, did you know you were going to go into the arts? I think I didn't know, but it was one of those things where everyone around me was telling me it all the time and I was drawing all the time. So it just kind of made sense. It's like the thing that I enjoy most, I'm probably the best at this out of anything else I'm trying, and I like to do it, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm doing it every day, and it just feels good. So it just makes sense. Yeah, you do it all the time, right? Yeah. Pretty much, you're always, there's always, it seems like there's always a pencil or something in your hand. Yeah. Making it. Yeah, I was talking to uh, Zachary Sattinger. Oh, yeah. And he goes, oh, yeah, I remember that kid. He goes, yeah, he had these unbelievable drawings that were really intricate. So even in high school, though I don't know if you knew him or not, you had a class together. I think together. I knew him vaguely. Yeah, you had a class together, and he vi vividly remembers your drawings. I think that's what people mainly remember, because there is, like, it seemed like every year there was, like, a couple of kids who were, like, the standout art kids, just like there would be a couple of kids who are the standout football or right. music or whatever, and I was definitely one of those kids, like, for my year. And the other ones were like some of my best friends. Yeah, yeah. And so when you so you go to college or you're going to college, what do you decide to do? I know you end up going to CCA. Yeah. In, in Oakland, but I, how, how did that all play out? I started for animation. That's what I was setting out to do there. And so I was looking at schools in California for animation because I wanted to do um, not traditional animation, but kind of like experimental animation and. Uh, maybe turn that into like an independent production house or something. Um, and then I got there and I was like kind of disappointed with the animation program. Like it looked amazing when I like set out to go there. And then by the time I got there, I was like, I don't know if this is the right fit. I mean, we're animating these bouncing, like just a, a ball bounce like this. Right. You know, we're just doing that for months and months and months. And I have this tackled in the first day. And I'm like, I can't do this for the rest of the year. Like, <laughs> was I'll... that on computer, I assume? Uh, no, it was hand-drawn. Oh, I see. And then eventually we would go to computer with it. So there's months and months of drawing it. And then it would probably be another month of like doing it on the computer. I'm like, this is going to drive me insane. Yeah. Like, I can't just be doing this for months. And um, a number of my friends that I had made were in the illustration program. And so they were all just kind of telling me how great it was every day. And I'm over here kind of like doing the bouncing ball. Yeah. Doing a bouncing ball and just kind of like, what am I doing? And so eventually I just like transferred over there and it was just like the best, you know, cause I figured even if I'm not going to do straight illustration, like it's just good to have like as much drawing fundamental under my belt as possible. And what did you learn in that process? Because you already are very skilled with a graphics person, but it's not, you know, it's not illustration and it's not cl taking classes. What did yeah. they teach you that was different than what you were already doing? Um, I think one of the main things is uh, about intentionality. So it's about instead of making something and then it just kind of comes out how it comes out, kind of architecting the process through thumbnails and sketches and like going into bigger sketches to the final and having what you see in your brain to start with be what you end up with because a, lo a lot of people can um kind of start with something that's vague in their brain and then it just kind of ends up mm -hmm. you know as whatever it ends up as like artifacts of the process like mm -hmm. oh i made a mistake over here or i did this over here but a lot of it is about like seeing it and then getting exactly what you want out of it mm. Um, that was one of the main things. There's a lot of technical stuff too. And so do you still use that intentionality? I, I try to. In what you do? 
Um, some of the paintings are more automatic, like they just come out and the process is just like clean mm -hmm. like that. But if I'm working on a bigger painting, I, I want to know where I'm going with it. Mm -hmm. So you do you, so you get a degree in uh, illustration? Yeah. yeah. And this is in what year you graduate? Uh, 2016? Yeah, the end of 2016. Yeah, I knew it was right in there. Yeah, because we had you in our Dixon show, which was 2017. And so right off the bat, you got a job working, helping uh, with the Hendrix estate, right? Tell us about yeah. that. That's pretty interesting. Um, so one of my teachers, Randy Chavez, who's like probably the best painter that I know, one of the best painters that I know. I guess I know a lot of painters, so I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't say that. But he is like an amazing painter. Um, he was painting a, I think, six foot by eight foot you know, absolutely massive painting of Jimi Hendrix and it's like cosmic and his guitar is exploding and becoming the universe and there's bees down there, there's hummingbirds, there's angels coming down, all sorts of stuff. And so uh, he, I think this is while I was in school, he knew that I had like this interest in animation that kind of like, it seemed like, what am I gonna do with this? Because I'm just mainly doing illustration stuff. He saw that interest and he was like, what would you think about animating this painting? And we kind of just started doing it like for fun. And it just like started working and I was teaching myself After Effects in the computer. And so we we made it so this whole painting kind of comes together through a storyline, through the cosmos. And when we were about like maybe three quarters of the way done, he says, oh, by the way, because he's a big poster guy, he's done a lot of posters. Um, he's, he said, by the way, my good friend Bruce who works doing all the licensing for Experience Hendrix, um, he wants to like talk to them about doing something more official with this. And so they, um, like we were able to make a deal with them and we were able to like license like music that's like Jimi Hendrix's music. So it's like very expensive. Um, and we got paid for it and he, uh, Randy made these aluminum prints that were just like, uh, some were the actual size of the painting, like massive. And so I just got to be pretty good friends with Bruce. And, um, you know, we, over the years, we've had a lot of crazy ideas about like projects to do together. And we had one that we wanted to do um, before the pandemic that was like a live show that may still happen at some point. So I won't do like too much details into it, but it was a live show with animation, with mm -hmm. Jimi Hendrix, with a lot of stuff going on. And, you know, it didn't happen because of the pandemic, but it, it could potentially in the future. So how do you deal with that in the sense that, so you're doing this animation, which is successful, clearly, yeah. I mean, you're looking at Hendrix. Come and on. we, uh, the best part about that whole thing, yeah. sorry. No, it's good. Um, the best part about that whole thing is because of all those connections, they had a 50th anniversary of the Monterey Pop Festival yeah, that was over there, which yep. is Jimmy's first show in America and Otis Redding's first show uh, in front of a big audience and like the animals and like all these legendary acts for the first time all together. Right. They had a 50th anniversary and we got free VIP tickets to it. And so <laughs> it was just, that was the best. <laughs> That's funny. And who all, who all came to that? Um, the who I was still alive <laughs> the Eric Burden from the animals was there yeah. and that was cool to see um there were I'm, I'm forgetting the name there was a blues guy who was there who is one of the, the biggest alive now kind of like a newer guy but can really like shred on guitar yeah um but it was really cool and it was in Monterey at the exact same fairgrounds yeah. and it was really fun so yeah, so the question was, so you're you're doing this animation stuff and you're succeeding at it, but you also have this other component going on, which is Western art, yeah, which you truly clearly love and are very much succeeding. How do you either justify your time for both? Do you do both? I mean, how does that work out? Or do you know? You may not know. Um, I mean, I think I'm in the later stages of figuring it out. For years, I was kind of like balancing things back and forth, but I think. Um, there's something about the desert stuff that like just draws me and it's probably because like I lived here for so long. Your whole life. Basically. Yeah. So it's, it's part of like my neural makeup in a way. Um, so 
I don't know. I mean, it's a balancing act. Like some weeks I'll do a little bit more animation or I'll do album covers or I'll do paintings. But most of the time now is probably the paintings just because mm -hmm. it's it's what I'm currently really enjoying. So, yeah. And you so you start when did you start first doing paintings? Um, like just paintings yeah, of like, any sort? Yeah, well, yeah, you can give us that. Uh, probably elementary school, yeah, honestly. Okay. Not not oils. I did my first oil in high school. Mm. But watercolors and stuff, like mixed media stuff like that, I've been doing forever. Yeah. So in college, when you're doing illustration, was a lot of that uh, oils or was it mostly drawings? A lot of drawing, um, a lot of acrylics. There's a bit of oils. Like I took oil painting classes but somehow it always felt like the kind of the fine artiness of the oil painting classes was like separate, you know? So I did a lot of um, really intricate ink drawings and putting them into the computer and then kind of manipulating them from there with color mm. and all that sort of thing. And so on, on when you start doing your Western paintings, when is that? Is that about 2016 too? Yeah. Yeah. And those um, are more intricate realism based I would say right yeah I felt like at least for a few years it would be worth it to just like push my chops you know try to get as much into the realism as I could mm -hmm. and then so now you've switched to a I don't know it's a more modernist you know sensibility I don't even you know I just call it the modern west really yeah there's a few people that are I would say that fall in this category Brett Allen Johnson Logan Hajaj um, Ed Mel, of course, he's the father. Yeah. Of it. I mean, he really is, right? Yeah. Or, I mean, him and Maynard. Yeah. You know, I think each level is like uh, pushes it in a new direction and makes it a yeah. new thing. Yeah. I mean, Maynard def definitely pushed it for what he was doing in the 20s, especially. But, you know, Ed pushed it to so far out there, you yeah. know, in a way that really, if you think about it, it's interesting. I don't know of anyone else who was really doing that contemporarily. Um, I don't know. I've only seen a few paintings before him that have the kind of jagged stuff. Yeah. But they're so like far and few in between. Yeah. Conrad Buff would do some of that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Definitely. For sure. Um. Yeah. But and his Buck Weaver was another one that would do it. Yeah. Um. And then I mean, you can see not quite the edges, but like that design sensibility you see in all the Taos guys that they're like it's very much like they're designing a picture mm -hmm. instead of just taking what's in front of them they're like oh well if i move these bushes over here and change the shapes of them this is like a much better composition right and you think about it maynard did illustration you mm -hmm. know the taos you know founders like bloom and shine burning house these guys all buck uh buck um Dutton did illustration you know ed yeah. Mel did illustration for many years mm -hmm. um dennis aminsky did illustration yeah, you just the the names go on and on and on, and so you have that in your background. So it seems like it's a natural fit for you to to do that. When do you remember what the first painting you did where you go? I'm pushing it out a little. I'm not gonna do the realism as much. Um, it wasn't that long ago, really. I remember the one where I really felt it because there were a lot of like kind of experiments here and there yeah. throughout the realistic like kind of period. Um, the one that I really remember is called the Golden Dawn. It was like a little yellow one. And immediately the response to that was like strange. You know, like it was it was a big response. And I was like, huh. Yeah. This is something to at least keep track of. And what, the Golden Dawn, did you do it just because you wanted to push it and see what you could do? Yeah. Um, I also, I had this kind of feeling like when I'm looking at a wall of paintings that... Um, you know, what sticks out to me isn't like straight realism. You know, what sticks right. out to me is good design. And if you can bring like good design into a realistic painting, then you hit all the sweet spots. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when you sent me your first group and I was like, oh, you've hit something here. I don't know yeah. if you remember that conversation or not. I, I remember the conversation that we had in uh, Moab yeah. with Charles. And yeah. that was like, that was like a good art talk with all of us and... Yeah, it kind of hit some of it home. Yeah. Yeah, no, I could clearly see it. Yeah. I mean, and I don't know if you remember this or not, but this is my question to you, you know, because I think it's really important for an artist. My question was, 
are you having fun doing this? Is this something you want to do? Yeah, and I am because there's this thing about like realism that I love when it's going right, but when it's not going right and you're like going through these little details and you take a step back, you're like, do these small details matter right now? Like I, I'm futzing over like these little tiny details and no one else is going to care about this, but I'm just trying to, it's almost like trying to prove that you can do like the most real thing and I'm not sure, it, it hits a different part in your brain. Whereas when you're designing something out, it's like, it's yours, you know, and you're making a statement and it just feels good. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you can do big. I mean, you've been doing big paintings too. Which yeah. Is, do you find those harder than the small ones or easier or no um, different? Not necessarily. I mean, sometimes when they're going well, it's the same feeling, but with a bigger brush. You know, if that makes sense. Um, and I try to kind of use like just the same consistent brushes, but like at a bigger size. And it's honestly, it's easy um, most of the time. Mm. So, you know, there's struggles, I feel like in the process, a lot of the process is like, if this is like 100% of the process, the first 60% or so is like, you don't know exactly how it's going to go, even if you have like the final image in your head. And then when you get to the last point, it, it just kind of like seals itself and comes together. Mm. The last 40%? Or, yeah, I yeah. would say so. And then the last 10% feels good, you know. Have you done some where you go, mm -mm, this didn't work? Yeah, I, I have a couple of those and I keep them around because, you know, maybe I'll have an idea that'll fix it, uh -huh. you know. Yeah. I think if I was an artist, that's what I would do. Yeah versus just scraping and go so I've, many of them scrape and go I've, I've never done that yeah a canvas like doesn't really cost enough to do that you know I, I'd rather get a new canvas and potentially come back to something because if I started a painting there was a reason you know and just because it didn't finish itself like in the manner I wanted it to doesn't mean that it can't right I know that's happened for Ed, at least. He's told me that yeah. he's put things away for many years and come back and revisit and go, oh, I see this a little differently than I did. Yeah. Uh, and so tell us, yeah, how what is this like? I mean, you, you've gotten this response now. We, we get your works in and we sell them immediately, pretty much. Yeah. So that's a weird thing, right? I mean, it's a little surreal. Yeah, right? To be honest, yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I can't complain. Yeah. I like it. And I think the fact that it's the work that I like doing more and it has that response is like, that's the best. Yeah. Why do you think people respond to it so much? Um, I think one of the things is that when you're kind of controlling a composition, there's every area is considered. So the full thing becomes a statement, you know, and if you're not kind of controlling all the little meandering things, then it has potential to not be like a statement. Like the, the painting itself should have like one statement that confronts the viewer, at least I think, like immediately. And then they can go into the details and see the little things and how it's painted and the texture and all that, but that should come after. Whereas I feel like if there's too much like little detail in certain areas that it tends to detract from a larger statement. You think by doing all those intricate drawings that you've done for decades, has helped you realize how to edit? Definitely. Yeah. It, it's a lot about omitting stuff. Yeah. It's really what it is, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm, are, are there times when you get over one of those paintings, your new paintings, these more modern sensibility paintings, and you have to put the throttle on to not do too much? Yeah. Because um, I, I feel like it's, it's easier to overwork than to underwork. And so if I... On a painting, if I feel it like hit the place where I'm like, this is done or it could be done, a lot of times I'll just stop painting and I'll go do something else because I don't want to overwork it. If it hits a sweet spot, there's no reason to push it like past that because what if you don't get it again? Um, and I think I have like certain qualifications for kind of like when something's done. Like I don't want too much of a canvas to show through um, and I don't want there to be like, you know, too much mark making unless it's like necessary um but i i'd rather underwork than overwork mm. i think is what i feel now at least and do you think your palette is going to change at all probably yeah 
It's just interesting to see. I mean, yeah, you know, there's a kind of a specific palette you have right now that I could see evolving into maybe something even a little more something. I don't know, Brian. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because a lot of the new paintings, the palette will just like come out of my head. Mm. But then there's other ones where like, oh, I saw this in northern Arizona and these were the colors and I wanted to paint this because of those specific colors. And then I can feel kind of like that bleeding into other things. So it'll be like I saw a hill that was this specific like kind of chocolate brown color or something and I really liked it in real life and then when I'm painting something that's like directly from imagination um it'll like be in there mm. you know like it kind of just emerged so you spend a lot of time out in the field I know you've made a lot of trips in New Mexico Utah yeah. Arizona how important is that to not only your process but do you think for other artists that want to try to do what you're doing I think it's essential yeah. um, because like one of the reasons that I've been able to do so many things just out of my anime, out of my imagination um, is because I've spent a lot of times drawing mountain forms and like looking at mountains and looking at cliffs and all this. And there are shapes that reappear. Um, so you get a sense that there is this kind of um, like a motif that exists, like rocks break in certain ways and like any geology, geologists will tell you that um, and so if you can begin to understand how they break and how the shapes are put together and stuff just by looking at them then you start to be able to create them yeah um, yeah I believe that what about figures you really haven't gone to that route even though you do great these amazing figures and you're very tight stuff that you're yeah. drawing. I mean, that's all figurative stuff. But you haven't implored any of those into your paintings yet. Or will you? Or I, I will, but it has to uh, it has to make sense for the painting. Yeah. But I, I feel it coming. I just want to, I want to do it right. You know, like, so if I'm doing uh, any sort of, like, subject matter with humans, like, I want it to be accurate. Um, and I want to get... when you say accurate, what do you mean by that? Like... Some of the stuff like on the saddles and like in terms of things that people would wear historically mm. and in terms of just like getting people for their region type of thing. Mm. Um, I also like I want if I'm going to use like live models or something like I really want it to be perfect. So it has to be like either someone I know who I know will fit something really well or just somebody who like looks great in a painting. Um but it'll happen. I mean, I do a lot of horses, which are not human figurative, but they're like, yeah. they're getting there. So, But those are in your more realistic, yeah. you know, look. Well, how do you translate to what you're doing now? I mean, Ed's done it tremendously, you know. He's done some, you know, and then again, you know, Logan and, and has done it, but in a different way. He's not as out there as, yeah. you know, as you are as far as you're pushing the envelope, I think. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, I I try to have like a almost like a rubber band spring between like pure abstraction and realism. Mm. So I can kind of, in at least in my mind, I can push back and forth between mm. the two. And um, as long as I don't like sit over here or sit over here too much, then it always kind of has like a cool feeling to it mm. as long as it's bouncing around. So I think that there's a way to do the figures where they're not straight up realism, but that they have enough like realistic light to them mm -hmm. where they're like visually interesting and like they almost feel sculptural and Yeah, I think that's the key, actually. Yeah. Is the sculptural. I think so too. It's the light. Yeah. That's very interesting. So where do you go from here? You know, you've been doing you're out of school for five years now. Yeah. You know, you've already been you've had a major you were part of the Maynard Dixon show in two thousand seventeen, which was a major show. Yeah. And um, you're doing Hendrix stuff. You're doing other covers. Um, where I know we're having a major show for you in December. This is a year out it's right now when we're listening to this. is December uh, of 2021, and we're going to have one in December of 2022. We already mm -hmm. planned it a year ahead. But what, what's up for you besides that? We can talk about that, but what's up? Um, I think a lot of painting, you know, and I want to, yeah, I mean, number one, you heard it paintings. here, folks, medicine yeah. and gallery There's going to be more coming your way. <laughs> yeah. Um, and kind of like just pushing it, you know, and I want to make some larger works eventually. I mean, in my head, I've always had this thing. Uh, I don't know if you've seen 
like the scale of Salvador Dali's paintings ever, mm -hmm. but he was painting some like 40 foot by like 60 foot, like where do you put this type of paintings? Yeah. I want to do some of those eventually, but maybe that's an old man thing, you know, like uh, when I'm old, but I don't know. I'm, I want to push the scale. Um, I think a thing that I would really like to do is do like a mural, like a large scale, um, not on the wall, but on a huge canvas mm. type of mural um, of like a big landscape. I think that would be fun. Yeah. You know who you have to talk to is David Nickel. Oh, yeah. He's the master, man. Yeah. That one Grand Canyon one. And that's that, nothing. Yeah. He's done bigger than that. Five times bigger than that. Really? Oh, yeah. Not as maybe in a painting for my ha for the you know gallery. That was yeah. a four by eight or so. But I mean, he's done 20 by 50. 50 kind of foot paintings yeah so that's the guy that you want to i mean if nothing else he can just tell you the process yeah of what's required because he's done dozens of these so that's that's the guy. yeah i'd like to actually i think it would be great we should say right here that you do like a 40 60 for the gallery something sizable it'd be interesting yeah. to see how that translates 48 out. by 60 yeah 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 i think that would be fun yeah and then with the with the new frames that would look really nice as yeah, well. Yeah, let's talk about framing because I think this is an important uh, component for any artist. And yeah. You and I have had this discussion about, you know, frames and, and what it means. So, all right, what's your process been through from framing? What have you done and what are you doing? Um, so, you know, in the past I was starting out, you know, and so right. I knew probably nothing right. about frames when I was starting. Do they teach you any of that in, in no. I college i wonder if they even do in like a painting program but yeah. that seems like it should be a full class because yeah, like of course you have to teach yourself that when you get out of school and yeah. it seems a little like as if the professors don't have that knowledge right they must or maybe they don't because they but then, paintings aren't good enough they haven't had to but, worry about putting real frames but then that's sad yeah you know um <laughs> but so i had to kind of teach myself and like find um for a while, the most economical but best, you know, so it's, it was always this balance right. between those. And I don't want a bad frame, but I, uh, at least in the beginning, I didn't want to spend a bunch of money on them. So it was always this push and pull about finding something that looks really good and isn't going to like break the bank or be uh, 10 times as expensive as a painting because then what's, that doesn't make sense mathematically. Right. Um, but more recently, I found a lot like better frames, and even more recently, we started doing the signature frame, um, which we have the first paintings that have them right now. And so that painting that we that you brought in, that's going to be the, your signature frame from now on. Yeah, yeah. I like that. And tell so, us about that. We'll we'll put it on the uh, YouTube for people who are want to see what it looks like. But for those who are just listening, tell us how did you get to that uh, frame, that hand carved frame, kind of a geometric looking frame. And, um, and yeah, and how did that happen? So, um, a while ago you had recommended to me, uh, Travis at Gold River yeah. Gallery. And so I think two years ago I had him do like a big frame for me for a commission and he just did an amazing job and he like brought it down here cause it was so big to deliver it. And I was like, okay, I can work with this. Yeah. Somebody who like delivers a frame for me. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and so I've always kind of, I've been keeping him in the back of my mind and then you recommended it again and I started talking to him and I did a bunch of kind of design drawings, um, like loose at first and then eventually tightened up sketches where it's like half inch here, quarter inch here and kind of doing like um, the topography of it, but then also doing the design on the face of it. And we went through a few iterations and kind of came out with this. And I think, you know, we may tweak it like a little bit over time, but for the first run, I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah. Like, and so that frame or something close to it probably will be the Josh Gibson frame and yeah. no one else will be able to use that uh -huh. frame, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. I yeah. think this is so important for our artists that are listening. And I've had this discussion. I had it with Josh. I've had it with other artists, you know, it's very difficult when you're first starting out because your paintings aren't worth that much, right? Or probably aren't. Um, and But you still need to put a really good frame on it, or as good as you can. Because a bad frame or a cheap-looking frame on, on even a great painting can really hurt its, you know, how it's presented. And that doesn't mean that there aren't great paintings with not the greatest frames on them, 
but you're much better off to, to come up with your own design to, to, to what you do. I mean, Ed, again, I keep coming back to Ed Mel, but, you know, he's, you know, he's a good person to use as a, as a reference because mm-hmm. he's worked with Collier Frames for 40 years. He has, you know, the frames have changed over time, but they are always his frames. So, as you know, his late 80s and 90s were small and painted to match the painting. Then he went to gold frames that were... You know, you know, always had a signature on the side of them, and then they became, you know, you probably had six or seven different kinds of frames, but they're all, you can look at them and go, that's all an Edmel frame. And I've told people who have gotten their paintings that sometimes they want to change a frame or an Edmel frame. I say, yeah, well, you can do it, but if you get rid of that frame, you're making a monstrous mistake if you ever want to go sell it because people are going to want it right back on there. Yeah. And um, so hopefully that will be the case with you. But I think it's important for artists that, you know, framing is not an insignificant thing. It's an important component of the whole package that you have to do. So if you're out there and you're using lousy frames, figure out a way to raise the prices of your paintings and put on a better frame. And you'll get better response in galleries, too, by the way. Mm -hmm. There's nothing worse, in my opinion, than seeing a really great painting come in on a really bad frame. Yeah. You know, that the artist did. And my artists don't do that, um, but, you know, they may when they first start. Yeah. And I think, you know, as the person painting it, you have, like, the best kind of knowledge of your own sensibility. Mm-hmm. So you know what to complement it with. And, Correct. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, like, cool frames that are, like, stock frames, but they're not going to be the same flavor. Like, they're always going to be just a touch off. Right. Um and so I think it's, you know, it's good to have the same design sensibility. And like with these frames, um, I can feel the difference when I touch it, mm. you know, and I think that that's something that you don't really notice if you're dealing with cheaper frames, you don't notice that the materials are worse. Obviously, they're probably getting them shipped in from someplace um, and they're they're put together a little bit more shoddy. Um, and, and often I will tell you those kind of frames too will have problems later on. Yeah. You know, the gelding will peel off or, you know, there'll be an issue. They'll, you know, start cracking and stuff. Yeah. And you don't want to have to replace them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when it's clearly that the frame was just not very good. Mm-hmm. And so um, let's talk something about NFTs because you're 28. Yeah. And um, what do you think about NFTs? Um, I think, and I've talked to Charles about this a, a hundred times, if not a thousand. Yeah, probably a thousand. Yeah. Because he he's all into that space and like he really knows it, you know. Um, I think that in my mind, I understand like I understand why a lot of the things have like sold on there. But in my mind, the really interesting part about it is when the NFTs start getting linked to kind of things you can unlock in a metaverse type of thing, like a virtual right. world. So if you can buy a piece of art. And then by buying that, you have access to this virtual party or a virtual club or a virtual space where you can meet other people. Or or, the artist. Exactly. Uh, If it unlocks even a real world thing where you could have a a dinner with the person who made it, Mm. you know, or anything like that. Um, Even as simple as unlocking like a thing in a video game, like say you buy this NFT and now you have the fastest car in the whole world in this video game. I I see the utility of that being like really important for the future. Um, and honestly, how else can you buy an animation? Um, there's a lot of things that you, you couldn't own before. Mm. And I think that's interesting that they kind of are opening up ownership. Um, yeah, you want a Van Gogh? You can probably get one. Yeah. And you could have one that has some sort of provenance behind it if, say, the Louvre or a place like that wanted to put out an edition. Yeah, which of, they are doing those Yeah. Things. And, I mean, they put out lithograph editions all the time, so it is a similar type of thing. But that's the other thing is um, having verified provenance for things that, like, can't be duplicated right. is amazing. I think the the fact that the art world hasn't latched on to that more is... Uh, it's crazy, but it's going to happen. I like, can tell you why they have it to some extent, because they want the privacy true. for the blockchain. So true. it's like they don't want, to, you know, dealers don't want you to know 
and collectors often who owned yeah. it before or any of these things, how, when it changed hands and all that. It's a very, for museums, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. For the dealer world, auction world, it'll be interesting to see how they um, actually evolve with the blockchain for um, you know provenance, which it should, but oh. I can see why they might not want. Yeah, I could too. I wonder if there's a way... Um, Cloaking it? <laughs> yeah, or theoretically taking it offline. Yeah. Like if you could have like a key fob type of thing that has your NFT stuff in it, and it's not directly online, like your wallet isn't online, but you could say scan it in a computer to utilize it, that might do some of it. Yeah. I'm sure it'll get worked out and it's going to happen. Yeah. I mean, the technology is uh, it's very ripe for doing something like that. And do you ever see your NFTs when you do them in the future, which I'm sure we will, um, but do you ever see those being worth more than potentially the paintings themselves? And if so, how do you feel about that? I'm not sure, to be honest. I, I could see a world where... Uh, the values are competing in a way where like these things will go up, then these will go up, then these, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure. It, it is surreal. It's it's very much like a Neil Stevenson book or something. <laughs> um, I mean, but we're getting there. We're going into like the cyberpunk kind of like era. Right. Supposedly. There's no flying cars though, which I'm kind of pissed about. But <laughs> Not yet. For those yeah. who don't know what a cyberpunk is, that's an NFT that's worth about a million and a half dollars if you have the right one. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and they're selling. <laughs> yeah. And most of my listeners would not care for the imagery at all. Yeah. Um, but then there, you know, and the Beeple stuff, yeah. which was like the famous $69 one. $69 million dollars for yeah. a painting. That's a that's, digital art. What I wonder about that is like, does that qualify as a bubble thing? Or is that like, what does that translate as? You know? Because it's it's completely possible that this is like that's the first phase of it, and then it peters out for yeah. a little bit, and then they figure out the technology more, yeah. and it just it easily. becomes a big thing. Yeah, easily. Yeah, like it, I mean it. Are, I mean clearly, if he, you know, Mike Mike Winklebach is you know is his uh, sixty nine million dollar record is the third highest price for a living yeah. artist. So it's it's a real thing. Yeah, and overnight. Yeah, and he had another one sold for 29 million recently as well, like some kind of digital sculpture. So Yeah. Yeah, it's really amazing how that has changed the world. Um do you think artists today need to be embracing that? Uh, you know, I mean, I think it's it's kind of particular to the artist, I would almost say, cuz like um does somebody like Ed Mel need an NFT? You know, I think he yeah. could have them. <laughs> well, maybe. But he could have them, but his paintings, like, as just his paintings, like, that'll get people there. You know, like, people will be there just for the paintings. Yeah, you know? but then you go, okay, well, I can't afford an, an Ed Mel True. anymore, but I can still afford an NFT, or at least now. That's smart. Um, yeah, so in a way, it could be, like, his uh, his new version of his lithographs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, or Doing maybe additions. more. You just don't know. Yeah that's, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I'll answer the question I presented to you. And my own thought is that, yes, I think that artists need to be at least investigating this. And it may not translate for a lot of painters. Yeah. You know, people may not want, you know, a cowboy on a horse as an NFT. You know, they may not. I don't know. I don't think we know the answer to that. more. It seems to be more digitally collectible stuff seem to be and digitally rendered things seem mm -hmm. to be that way. And but you have actually do those things. I mean, you do do some digital art, right? A lot of animation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it it could make sense, you know, but it has to be done exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And so, how many dealers out there are going to be able to give you advice? You know, that's the other yeah. interesting question. I mean, I'm on top of it, but only really because of my son's interest and in expertise. <laughs> I'll, in I'll ask him. He knows everything about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean. There are certain people who gonna who are going to become uh, like kind of new world experts. Yeah. On that type of thing. I think they are. Yeah. Or maybe already are out there. I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting thing. So now you're you're succeeding. You're almost twenty nine. You know, you've got a major show coming up with us next December. You've already been in a major show and a book. You know, you hit it pretty fast running. You know. But what about other artists that are coming out? Well, you have suggestions. I think it'd be good to hear from somebody who's kind of gone through the meat grinder and come out okay on the other end. But what do you, how, how do you suggest a young artist 
you know, making it or doing it? Who's got, you know, let's say who's gone yeah. to school, art school, and gotten a degree? Yeah. And, I, you know, honestly, I would say that going to art school is is really helpful, but not for everyone, you know, not necessary. Right. For Glenn everyone. Dean didn't, and he's fantastic, and yeah, we just sold out a show. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I really, really liked that show. Yeah. Um, I would say, I mean, and I can only speak from like where I'm coming from, you know, I don't know everything and all that, but one of the things that meant a lot to me is um, creating like enough foundation for yourself artistically that you can uh, pick and choose what you want to do and understanding that like your chops are always going to support you. So learning how to draw realistically and learning how to do things traditionally and all that is only going to help if you want to do something else. Because I know a lot of people who want to skip that kind of phase and it works for a lot of people. But I think that for me, that's helped me to like kind of do what I want to do. Um, having that foundation and then a lot of it is just like getting to know people who are in what you want to do you know and taking advice and asking questions and like if you don't know something ask like nobody's going to fault you for asking a question right I can tell you as a dealer not not only will they not fault you but they'll appreciate that you yeah. asked that question instead of trying to just muddle through it whether yeah. it's a frame or how you do your signature or you know, how to price things. That's a big one for a young artist is how do you price things. And most of them make the mistake of pricing things too low. Yeah. As a general rule. Yeah. And I, I think in terms of something like that, like uh, value is perceived a lot of the time. And so if you, you peg yourself like down there on a low value, then that's how people are going to see it. And it's unfortunate that a lot of these things like the frames and the signature and like a lot of technical stuff, even like hardware on a frames, like people aren't taught this and people don't know this. And so it'd be great if there was like, um, you know, one place where people could get that information. Mm. Cause I don't know any place where they're just saying all these little things that would really mm. help. I'll do it for my YouTube channel. Yeah, you I should. Think. I think I will. I know you've done some things like that yeah. for sure. Yeah. But there's other things I could do. Yeah. Because all these little things like, even hardware, there's a thousand different ways to do hardware on the back of a frame. Right. There are. Um, yeah. And so you can almost, that's almost like a signature in itself sometimes. Like you see the back of a frame, you can definitely know how old it is because there would be like those stamps right. and like. Um, Oxidation of the wood as well. Yeah. And like uh, if there's the kind of dust paper, you'll see like the weird oil stains in right. it or whatever's there. But those things are super valuable and they kind of get brushed under the table um, well, and I can just tell you one is having strong enough eye hooks that your painting's not going to fall off the wall if you, yeah. especially if you happen to paint on masonite Yeah, and, uh, you have to make sure it's strong enough. Yeah. And then having the frame be the right strength for it too, because right. if you have like too wide of a bar on a frame and then the painting's super heavy, it could bow or. Yep. Yeah. yeah. These are all fun things. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anything last words you want to say? Well, one thing we should say is about your, you have a nice Instagram account that you put up posts. Give people that because it's not your name. It's something else. Yeah. Which, you know, you've had many comments on, but maybe I'll change it at some point. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's at dissolve, uh, D-I-Z-O-L-V, because um, that's kind of what it's always been and I kind of like it. Um, but yeah, I post like a painting about a week on there. Yeah, more than that. I think you, it seems like you make posts almost every day. Yeah. Reels, I mean, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I post like uh, stories and all that like almost every day, but. Yeah, yeah, until it goes Josh Gibson or Josh Gibson paintings or something. I've looked. Or There's Josh other Gibson Josh Gibsons. Or dissolve Josh Gibson. Yeah. If you want to get rid of all those other Josh Gibsons on Instagram, <laughs> then I'll take one of those. I want the clean name, you know? Yeah. Goes with your paintings. I get yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like my website is joshgib.com. Like I like the yeah. clean kind of as short as possible. Yeah. Well, I think there is something to that too as well. It's easier to remember in yeah. some respects. All right. You're the youngest guy I had on. You know, usually I go on these long tirades about the backstory in Vietnam and I you wasn't. Know, I wasn't in Vietnam. You know, there was none of that. You weren't around for Woodstock or Altima or nothing. But you do have a wonderful story because you've succeeded at a young age. Um, and I think 
at some point in time, people will come back to this uh, podcast, you know, when you're 40 or 50, and it'll be very interesting to see, for you as well, Yeah. you know, to see, okay, this is where I was. Yeah, I was pretty much on. I think you'll find, probably find, yeah, I was pretty much on, you know. You may have evolved into some other things, or you might have been, the NFT thing will be the most, probably the most interesting, because it'll be either, oh, wow, remember they had that thing called NFTs? Or yeah. it'll be, oh, my God, I underestimated NFTs so badly. <laughs> <laughs> I I think there's a way to utilize it, you know, but for me, I think it's alongside the paintings, you know, in some fashion. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm old school though, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I didn't grow up with a, you know iPhone in my you know, hand at age four months. Yeah. So I don't know how it's going to translate differently. It's going to translate differently. We mm -hmm. see the world differently. You know, my generation sees it differently. Your generation sees it differently. And then the coming generation definitely sees it differently. Yeah, because my generation, we had like a few years of like pre-internet. Yeah, and no um, phone. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't have a phone until like, I guess, high school. Yeah, probably so. Yeah. I mean, so it's, yeah, it's a different world. Yeah, I didn't have a phone till high school. <laughs> I'm I, like, for you, I, didn't, it's, yeah. I didn't have a phone till I was like 40. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um. And some ways, I wish it was, you know, it's a double-edged sword. The phone it, is a double-edged sword. I, definitely. I can't do my business without it. I love being able to communicate with my children and do things immediately. But at the same time, you know, it is a distraction. Yeah. It, you know, it is what it is, though. Yeah. It, it's a good tool. We just got to use it, right? Yeah, it's a tool. That's right. All right, Josh, let's go look at the new work. And uh, before it's all sold out, because yeah. I don't think it's going to last very long. I yeah. texted somebody before we went into the podcast, and they may have already come in. We don't know. Um, but, yes, yeah, so I appreciate you having having you on, and mm -hmm. I look forward to seeing the next 20 years. Yeah, I'll come back in 20 years. Yeah, I hope I'm still around <laughs> and can do a podcast in 20 years. But it's been fun watching you grow up. And, you know, and I, you know, when I took you into my gallery, it was on your merits, period. Yeah. I was like, okay, this guy has chops, you know? Because if you didn't have the chops, I would have just said, eh, I like your stuff. Let, yeah. Let me give you some people you can talk to. But yeah, it was like, okay, he's got the chops. Yeah. Yeah. It made a hell of a difference, you know? It can. Yeah. I mean, that is a leg up, no doubt, probably. But yeah. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't matter if you don't paint the paintings that, yeah, you that, and they don't to... sell, then... It doesn't, you know, you being in my to... gallery does nothing for you. Yeah. You still got to draw every single day. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Draw and paint and love it and absorb it. And that's all you do. I've watched you close hand in many situations. And <laughs> that's what you do. That's why you're a real artist. I tell people, yeah, he's in there for the long haul. Some artists aren't in there for the long haul. I can yeah. see it. You know, they're like, oh, I want to make money, blah, 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 or whatever. They don't have that driving, I got to go do this. Yeah. I mean, that's a nice byproduct, but... yeah. You have to feel like there's something to communicate. Yeah, well, you're definitely doing it. So, love what you're doing right now. It's fantastic, and I'm excited our show in 2022. So. Yep, and it'll be a good one. Yep, stay tuned, folks. All right, thanks, Josh Gibson. Cool, thank you. Yeah.